The reading for this week is chapter 15, sections 1 and 2. And this covers uh, the basic properties of stars. And there's a whole lot of information there. It gets pretty detailed. So again, I just want to go through the, the main properties. So the whole point of what we're covering this week is what's called a main sequence star. And the main sequence is basically, uh, the whole idea is that we, just like people, we can group um, the stages of a star's life into different phases. So we have star birth, which is actually what we'll be covering, uh, I think, next week. We have the adulthood phase, the main part of a star's lifetime that spends 90% of its life on. And then we have star death. And actually, the star death is the most interesting part of all this, because that's when we have supernovae and uh, black holes and neutron stars and all that kind of cool stuff. But so that we'll be covering that in a couple weeks here. But so we do need to understand what's going on with main sequence stars, because all of these stars have something in common, and that's that they're undergoing nuclear fusion at their center. That's the basic defining property of a star. And these main sequence stars, uh, it works out pretty well that we can, once you know one thing about a main sequence star, you know everything else about it. So what I mean by that, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, the whole idea is that if you have a main sequence star, it falls into one of seven classes, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. It's one of those seven letters. Uh, historically, there's some reasons why it's not just A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, it's complicated beyond the scope of the class. But if you're interested, read up on um, uh, Annie Jump Cannon from Harvard. She was actually one, of, I think, the first female from Harvard who got her PhD there. And she's essentially the one that originated this whole entire classification scheme. So blame her if you don't like the, the order of it. But uh, the, mnemonic, the mnemonic to remember this by, uh, I post this in the course discussion, but O, oh, be a fine girl or guy and kiss me. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Again, if you want to uh, figure out something a little more clever than that that you can remember more easily, uh, by all means, please do. As long as it, it's O, B, A, F, G, K, M in that order. And the whole idea here is that once we know one of the star's properties, um, its mass or its luminosity or its size or its temperature or its color or its lifetime, we can know every other property of that star as long as it's a main sequence star, as long as it falls into one of these seven categories. So if I were to tell you that we're dealing with an O star, all of a sudden you would know all of those properties. You would know roughly what its mass is, you would know its luminosity, and blah, blah, blah. If I tell you that our sun is a G-type star, um, or if you have one other G-type star, if you, if you know some other star is a G-type star, you'll know it's very similar to our sun, which is a G-type star. And it, so if you know our sun's luminosity, if you, if you know our sun's mass, and if you know our sun's temperature, for example, you'll be able to roughly guess at the mass, the temperature, the luminosity of this other star because it's the same class of star. Now, obviously, not all G stars have exactly the same numbers, and not all M stars have exactly the same numbers. But to within 10% or so, all the stars in a single class are roughly the same. So that's why this is so important. So just going through each of the properties and how mass, luminosity, color, temperature, radius, lifetime, how all of those things are related to its classification. So first of all, mass. The most massive stars are the O and then the B type stars. These stars have the very most mass going on the other end, the G and then the K, and then finally the M stars are the least massive stars. The luminosity. So by the way, luminosity is just a, a big word for how much total light the star gives off. The brightness, essentially. Not necessarily how bright it looks to us, we'll get to that, but the total amount of brightness that the entire star is giving off. And turns out the most massive stars are also the most luminous. The stars with the most mass, the O and then the B type, also give off the most light. And that I think that kind of makes sense, conceptually. Next, the size. And this is, again, kind of obvious. If you have a very massive star, the most massive stars are also the very largest. So you pack more mass into a bigger star, the smaller the star gets, the, le the less massive it gets. And again, common sense, but that's how it works. Oh, wrong one. The temperature. And uh, just like these other things, the most massive, the brightest, the biggest stars are also the hottest stars. So O-type stars are incredibly hot, over 30,000 Kelvin. For example, our sun is only about 5,800 Kelvin, and M-type stars are they can be around 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So it ranges all the way from 3,000 Kelvin to over 30,000 Kelvin. Uh, by the way, you, you can roughly double that, and that's about the temperature of Fahrenheit. It's not an exact number, but... OK, the color. It turns out all M stars have roughly the same color, and they're very uh, most mostly red, orangish red. As we go from red stars here, it gets a little more into the yellow range, and greenish, and then bluish violet, or even ultraviolet. So o, o stars and then B stars tend to look blue to, to our naked eye, actually. You can actually see some of the bluer stars out there. And then K and M stars very much look red to our eye. Uh, one of the examples of a, of a red star would be Betelgeuse. 
if any of you are familiar with them. It's one of the stars in Orion. It actually looks, it has a reddish tint. And just above Betelgeuse's Rigel, um, known for, among, among other things from Simpsons fame, it's where Kang and Kodos are from, Rigel 7. Um, anyway, um, Rigel, which is also in the constellation of Orion, looks kind of bluish to the naked eye, and it's an O-type star. So the color, if you look at its color, you can tell what type of star it is. And finally, the lifetime. Now this is, a, this is counterintuitive, we'll get to this a little bit, but it turns out the very longest lived stars, the stars that live longest, are the M-type stars. And the very least massive, I'm sorry, the very most massive stars, the O-type stars, have the shortest lifetimes. Uh, there's a reason for that, but we'll get to that. So just to kind of sum it up, which one of these stars is which class? I'll let you figure out. I mean, I guess it would have been more complicated if I put them out of order, but uh, yeah, which one are O-type stars, which one are M-type stars, and which ones are in between? So, okay, I want to go through a couple of the relationships. Uh, how is mass related to luminosity? How is color related to temperature? How is lifetime related to mass? And so on. So, the most massive stars, like I said, are the most luminous. That means the more massive a star is, the more stuff it has in it, the more light it's giving off. And conceptually, the way this makes sense to me is that basically the, the light from that star comes from nuclear fusion. When you're taking hydrogen, turning into helium, it gives off light. So the more hydrogen you have, the more light you can produce, because basically you're burning through your fuel. The more fuel you have, which in this case the fuel is the hydrogen gas, the more fuel you have, the longer you can burn your, I'm sorry, not the longer, but the more fuel you have, the more the more light you can give off. And that's what's happening. The most massive stars has way, have way more fuel, so they're giving off way more light. They're burning through that fuel because they have a lot higher store of it to begin with. So the most massive stars give off the most light, that means they're the most luminous. And there's an exact relationship. Uh, it turns out that the luminosity goes as mass to the 3.5th power, if I'm correct. Uh, you don't need to know that. It, it mentions that in the lab for this week, but um, you're not going to need to calculate exact figures. But just understand that the luminosity rises as the mass rises. OK, now how is the color related to the temperature of a star? So like I said, the, the very hottest stars were the most massive, and the very bluest stars were also the most massive. Um, I guess it'd be that direction for you guys on the screen. But anyway, uh, so the very hottest stars are blue, and the very coolest stars are red. Turns out that's actually a fundamental principle of how light works. Any object that's very hot gives off very blue radiation. And actually, it turns out that the hotter you make something, it so you might, you might start with something that's cool that's maybe giving off reddish light. You increase its temperature, so you might go from red to kind of orangish light that's giving off to maybe yellow. And then you increase the temperature even more, it starts giving off blue light. If you keep increasing that, it will actually turn to ultraviolet light that's giving off. And some of the most massive stars out there, some of the very hottest stars, are giving off mostly ultraviolet light. Now on the other end of the spectrum, the very coolest stars are the ones that are giving off mostly red light. And if you've ever, if you've ever sat around a campfire, you, you actually know this, because uh, if you have a very hot fire, all the ashes are incredibly hot, you, most of the ashes are white, or most of the, the burnt logs are glowing bright white which is a combination of all blue and orange and yellow and red and everything. But with a really cool fire, once it's died off, once it's almost dead, those ashes turn just kind of a dullish red color. And you can actually tell the temperature based on how much red light or how much blue or those, those other types of light on the blue side of the spectrum it's giving off. So again, the point is the redder something looks, the cooler it is. And the bluer something looks, the hotter it is. And the nice thing is we can actually directly measure the, the temperature on the surface of stars that are thousands of light years away just by looking at what type of light they give off. Is it blue or is it red or is it somewhere in between? And there, there are exact ways of measuring exactly the temperature, but we, we're not going to get into that in this class here, or at least not yet. Okay, so the other one that I wanted to mention, because this is a little bit counterintuitive, and when I learned this, it didn't make sense to me either. But it turns out that the very least massive stars have the longest lifetimes. So those M-type stars live way longer than the gigantic, extremely massive O-type stars. Now, the reason for this actually makes sense once we think about it. The most massive stars have way more fuel, way more hydrogen gas to burn. But they're also the very most luminous, way, way more luminous than the other types of stars. So that means that they're burning through their fuel way faster than the M-type stars or than the K-type or the G-type stars. And the faster you burn through your fuel, the faster you're going to run out of it. So even though they start with more fuel, they're burning it way, way faster than those low mass stars that don't have much luminosity. So turns out that the more mass you have, the faster you burn through your fuel and the shorter your lifetime is, in fact. Now the O-type stars, I'm sorry, the M-type stars, 
these very low mass stars, their luminosity is very low. They're not giving off much light at all compared to the other stars. So these are the stars that burn through their fuel so slowly that they can actually live to be over 100 billion years old, which actually is about 10 times more than the lifetime of the universe right now. The universe has only been around for about 13.8 billion years or so, which means that some of these stars that were born, you know, 5, 10 billion years ago are going to be around for another 90 billion years. So these are the very, very most longest lived stars. Some of these stars that were born right after the universe started haven't died yet. And for comparison, the O-type stars, they can live and die within less than a million years. So extremely rapid compared to 100 billion years. Okay, so we can put all of this together. All of these properties, the lifetime, the mass, the size, temperature, color, luminosity, all of that stuff, we can put into one diagram. And this is the single most important diagram that you're going to learn all semester. So it's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or HR diagram for short. Uh, whenever you see HR diagram, it means the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And the point here is that we're going to take the x-axis and we're going to plot out the color of it. And if you remember, the color is actually directly related to the temperature. So the x-axis plots out either, you can think of it as color or temperature. And then on the y-axis, we're going to plot out the luminosity, how much light the star is giving off. And the cool thing is, when we do this and we, we put in all of the different types, the O's and the B's and the A's and stuff, we can see a pattern directly developing here. So let's start out. Here's just the, the axes. And we start out with putting color here. And the, the convention is we put the bluish stars on this side and the reddish stars over here. And so like I said, this relates to the temperature. And we know that the, blue, the bluer stars have a higher temperature and the redder stars have a lower temperature. So you can also label it like this if you like, the temperature increasing in this direction. And then the y-axis, we plot out luminosity. And with luminosity, we're going to plot the brighter stars, or the stars giving off more light, to the top, and the stars giving off less light, or the dimmer stars on the bottom. And so what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to find where we will put the O stars. Now we know, first of all, the O stars are very hot, and they look quite blue to us. So they're going to fall on the left side of this diagram here. But we also know they're extremely bright. They, they have the most luminosity. So they're going to fall on the left side of the diagram, and they're going to fall all the way at the top. So there's O star. So any stars that are O-type stars are going to fall on the top left of this part of this diagram here. Now if we go to B-type stars, they're a little bit less luminous and a little bit cooler, or a little bit redder, if you will. So the B-type stars are going to be, where's my mouse? There it is. So the B-type stars are a little bit lower, and they're also a little bit further in this direction because they're a little bit cooler. So there's the B-type stars. Now if, when we go from B to A, an A-type star is just a little bit less luminous than a B. It's not giving out quite as much light, and it's a little bit cooler yet. So we go down and to the right, and that's where we find our A-type stars. And we keep on doing this. For each type, we go down in luminosity, and we go to the right in temperature, a little bit cooler each. So there's the F-type stars, there's the G-type stars, there's the K, and finally the M. So we see that the M stars lie all the way to the very red part of the spectrum or they're the very coolest stars. And they're also the very least luminous. On this axis, they give up the least amount of light. So they fall at the bottom right. And so here's the pattern. We see this nice diagonal line running from very luminous and very hot to very dim and very cool. So this whole thing is, this is why we have the name the main sequence. It's not a sequence like a set of steps that a star goes through in its lifetime. It's not a time sequence. It's a sequence on this direct diagram. So this is where that name main sequence comes from. It's a sequence of stars going from upper left to lower right on this HR diagram. So that's the basic idea. That's what, that's what the main sequence is here. And like I said, if you can place any of these stars on, um, into a category here, so if you know it's an A-type star, you can look down and you can figure out exactly what temperature it must be, or exactly what wavelength it's giving off of light. You can also look over here. And if I had these labeled, if there were labels for the luminosity, you could tell exactly what the luminosity of the average A star is. And when you know those things, you can figure out the mass. When you know the mass and the luminosity, you can use those to figure out the lifetime. Um, we're not going through this, but so once you know even one of those properties, you can basically take an average value of those properties for that class of star and figure everything else there is to know about that star, as long as it's a main sequence star. Uh, that's actually a really important point. If it's not a main sequence star, this stops working. So let's talk about some of those non-main sequence stars. So red giants, for example. 
or what a red giant is, it's, it's a star at the very end of its life. In the last 5% or so of its life, right before it's about to die, what happens is A, it gets bigger, so the giant part of it, and B, it cools off. So first of all, the expansion part of it, as it gets bigger, it has way more surface area to give off light. You know, so the, the way I compare this is if you have a, let's say, a, um, a billboard that has 10 LED lights by 10 LED lights. So you have 100 LED lights there. You're giving off some amount of light. But let's say you make that board, you stretch it out so there's 100 LED lights this way and 100 LED lights that way. Now, all of a sudden, you have 10,000 LED lights. The brightness of each of those lights hasn't changed, but the overall amount of light given off by that really big board is a factor of 100 bigger than it was before, just because you've increased the area of that sign. And that's basically exactly what's happening with these red giants. You make them much bigger by a factor of 100 or 10,000 or even a million times bigger, and you end up giving off way, way more light than the star used to. So as the star expands, its surface area increases, and it gives off more light, so it's more luminous. Now, as it cools off, something else happens too. We know that hot things give off blue light and cold things give off red light. So as the star expands and cools off, it also becomes redder. And that's hence the name. Red because it's cooler and giant because it's giant. <laughs> uh, so that's what a red giant is. It's a star at the end of its life, which it's expanded and it's cooled off and now it looks redder to us. So red giants have a very high luminosity because they're so big. And they, have, they, they look significantly more red than they used to back when they were in a main sequence phase of their life. So here's where the red, the red giants are going to be. We have the main sequence again. And let's take a red giant. We know the red giants are relatively cool, or they look red. So we look to where the red is here. And we know the red giants, because they're also extremely large, give off a huge amount of light. So they're also quite luminous. So a, riot, uh, a red giant is going to be all the way to the right, and then all the way up. So this is the red giant region of the spectrum, or of the diagram. Uh, by the way, in your book, you're also going to see some more stuff called super giants and super blue giants and blah, blah, blah. I'm just generically grouping all of this into, into the red giant uh, area of the diagram here. When we talk more about the, the death of stars, we'll see what the difference is between a super giant and a red giant. But for all purposes, it's effectively the same thing. So that's where the red giants are, again, because they're bigger, so they're more luminous and they're cooler, so they look redder. Now, one more thing. Uh, the, the textbook mentions something called white dwarfs. And again, we'll get to this later in the semester, but a white dwarf is actually, even after that red giant part of, this, part of the lifetime, after that star has finally given off its last gasps, gasps, it contracts. It actually becomes about the size of the Earth. So you take a star like our sun, it expands out to include all of the orbit of Mercury, Venus, Earth, maybe even Mars, in its red giant phase, and then it contracts to be as small as the Earth. And that's what a white dwarf is. As it contracts, it also heats up to very high temperatures. So because it's getting smaller, the surface area is increasing. So you're taking that 10,000 LED light bulb billboard, and you're decreasing it to just a billboard with maybe three or four lights. Those lights might be giving off a little more light now. It gets a little bit hotter. Each of those individual lights are giving off a little bit more light than they might have before. But the overall amount of light is much reduced compared to that big giant billboard that it just was. Um, I, the analogies are kind of stopping to work here, but uh, the point is when you decrease the size, the luminosity also decreases. So as a star becomes smaller, it loses its luminosity, but it also gets hotter. It's taking all that heat and compressing it and contracting all that heat into a very small ball, so it actually heats up. And very slowly over the course of tens of billions of years, it will very slowly evaporate that heat away. But a white dwarf, shortly after it forms, is very small, so not very luminous, but extremely hot. So when we look here, we take the main sequence, and now we go to the very hot end of it, the very blue end, and the low luminosity because its surface area isn't very large. And that's where the white dwarfs are. So this is the overall picture that you should be incredibly familiar with. This is, again, the most important picture that the most important diagram we'll cover this semester. The main sequence extends from low luminosity red stars, the M type stars, to high luminosity uh, hot blue stars, the O type stars. The red giants are up there because they're very large, so a lot of surface area to give off a whole lot of light, but very cool. And the white dwarfs are down here because they're very small, so not much surface area to give off light, but incredibly hot. And just to show you what 
a real diagram would look like. I've taken some artistic um, shortcuts there, but it's, it gets a little more complicated. And you see there's a, a slightly separate region for the giants and the super giants. But again, it's typically to the right and above the main sequence. And down here, the white dwarfs. Now, it's labeled many actual individual stars here. So it's kind of cool. Look this up in your textbook, and you can see each of the individual stars. Uh, but by the way, so the sun is a G-type star. It's about halfway in between the O's and the, and the M's. And the sun here, you can see it right there. So the sun falls in the G-type spectrum, and it has luminosity, you know, kind of high, not, not too high. So the sun is actually kind of a Goldilocks type star. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. It's kind of right about in the middle of all of these properties, which is convenient for us because it seems to be the most likely um, type of star that you can form life around. So works out. All right, so one final thing here. Uh, the book spends quite a bit of time talking about um, the, the distance luminosity apparent brightness relationship. And so it gets a little confusing. The book makes this more confusing than it really should be. So the idea here is that some of the very brightest stars we can see in our sky are actually K and M type stars, or maybe G type stars like our sun. They're not really that luminous, but they're very bright to us. And also, on the other hand, some of the very most massive stars we can see in the entire sky are some of the dimmest stars that we see as well. And it's not because they're incredibly massive, and it's not because they're very high luminosity. It's due to a different reason. So the reason that you can have a low luminosity star look very bright and a high luminosity star look very dim is the distance. If you take something that's really dim but put it right in front of your eye, it's going to look really bright to you. But if you take something that's incredibly bright and move it onto the other side of the galaxy, you probably can't even see it. And that's basically what's going on. The term for this is apparent brightness. So the apparent brightness refers to how bright the star looks to us, how bright it appears to us, so hence the name apparent. If a star looks really bright to us, it might mean that either it has a very high luminosity or it might mean that it's just really close to us. So compare that to the star's luminosity. The luminosity is an inherent property of the star. It's how much total light it gives off, regardless of how close or how far it is to us. So everyone in the entire universe will agree on a star's luminosity. But not everyone will agree on a star's apparent brightness. The people very close to that star will say it's bright. The people very far from that star will say it's very dim. So the luminosity is an inherent property, the total amount of light, whereas the apparent brightness depends very much on how close to that star we are. Now, the exact formula for this, um, the brightness depends on the luminosity. You double the luminosity, it appears twice as bright to us. But it's inversely related to the distance squared. So what that means is, if you double the distance, the star looks four times dimmer. If you triple the distance, the star looks nine times dimmer. One over three squared, or one over nine. So it's actually, the distance plays more of a role than the luminosity. That's why you can have extremely luminous stars that look really dim, because the distance is very, very much related to the apparent brightness of the star. So again, we're not going to be doing direct calculations, but that's that's the basic idea. And there's some, some rules that we can follow to derive this, but I don't want to get into that. I don't want to bore you here. Um, all right, so just to wrap all this stuff up here. Again, make sure you memorize the O-B-A-F-G-K-M scheme. And uh, this you're going to need to know this definitively. You need to know exactly what order all those are. You should also know how the mass varies as you go down that end, or go down that line. You should know how the luminosity goes from the O to the M, how the size, how the temperature, the color, and the lifetime are all related to those characteristics. So I can tell you right now, there will be questions on the exam saying, which is more luminous, a B type or an F type? Or which has a redder color, a G type, or, I'm sorry, or which has maybe, uh, which is redder, a M or a B star? Um, that gets a little difficult, difficult to quantize, but the point is, you should know how each of those varies as you go up or down that uh, the line. And you should definitely understand what the HR diagram is about. If I tell you you have a really luminous but a pretty cool star, you should tell me where that goes. If I tell you that you have a star that's medium luminosity but extremely hot, you should tell me where that goes, and so on. So make sure you understand how that works. And you should at least understand the basic idea, the difference between the brightness, the apparent brightness, and the luminosity know what the differences between those are, and know how the apparent brightness depends on the luminosity and the distance. Uh, again, you don't, you weren't, you're not going to need to solve mathematical problems, but at least understand the basic idea behind it. And then finally, do please read through uh, 15.1 and 15.2 in your textbook. Uh, this goes into quite a bit more detail than what I typically would in class, but um, 
hopefully you're actually understanding a lot of this as you go through. If you do have any questions, by all means, please contact me. I'll be happy to do my best to um, put you on the right track. And I know this is a little bit more difficult stuff. So if you are understanding all this, good job. Uh, if you're not, again, please feel free to ask. But all right, that's about it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about this again. Bye.